Hey, I'm Andre Gower. Ryan Lambert. And you're watching The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. It's an absolute delight to have you here. It is, of course, the 30th anniversary of Monster Squad, believe it or not. It's still as fresh as the day it was filmed. Uh, you know, it feels that way. It still holds up. And, you know, we've been doing, you know, for about 10, 11 years, seeing some retro screenings and meeting awesome fans. And it doesn't get old. It still kind of, it still kind of works, and the, and the fans still love it. So that's kind of why it kind of... Uh, always has fresh life like we're getting to you know we're getting to now wit uh see what should have been <laughs> in 1987 yeah. oh, the response yes yeah. the response so you know it's uh it's nice to hear the fans reactions Absolutely, and for anyone that hasn't seen the film yet, which they absolutely should have, and instantly it's still on Sky Cinema in the UK as well, so you can, you know, you can download it and watch it right now. What is the movie about? Uh, the movie is sort of, um, it's kind of the first time mashup of the classic Universal monsters being uh, Dracula and Frankenstein's monster, the Wolfman, the Mummy, and Creature from the Black Lagoon, who we call Gilman. But um, a group of kids in their neighborhood uh, figure out that Dracula is back to wreak havoc and take over the world with the forces of evil. And we're the only ones that know what's going on, find out, and have to make sure that doesn't happen. So uh, we band together and, uh, and, and fight the classic Universal Monsters. It's sort of what would happen if, those, if the little rascals fought the classic Universal Monsters. So, and so you play Sean and Rudy in the film. Now, uh, you're, of course, the, the leader of the Monster Squad, and you uh, turn, uh, really turns up very early in the film and saves the day straight away before with it and battles a different kind of monster, a bully, which is quite worse, I think. Absolutely, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. It's a, it has multi-layers where, you know, Rudy's character comes in and ends up, um, yeah, battling a different level of bad, of baddie. And, uh, you know, we talk about that, you know, c kind of a lot with your character, uh, that's really kind of what it was, and um, he, he'd be wrestling the, with his own like personal demons and finding his way in the world through this club of kids. You know, um, we don't know where he comes from. We don't know what happened in his, you know, what happens in his daily life. But you know, I like to think that he needs an outlet for something. Um, and uh, I think killing monsters is pretty much uh, sums a, <laughs> a good a good way to get your aggressions out. Yeah, I think I think your I think Rudy the, the Rudy character is uh, probably one of the most interesting because it could be the m most layered, like you've always said. And yeah, we we're all fighting this kind of you know sus suspension of disbelief, finding these supernatural monsters. But you're actually the focal point of battling kind of the real monsters of the day of what young kids would go through and but you at one point you might have needed saving you know because rudy characters is the cool guy we all know that he's the cool guy but i think it's an interesting take on the cool guy that usually the cool guy is usually the reluctant hero at the end you know like you know the james dean rebel without a cause he doesn't want any but you're out there but that's for the that. thing like everyone thinks those characters are like cool quote unquote right. but the truth of the matter is they i mean even james dean's character in rebel without a cause is like he's an outsider that just doesn't just doesn't fit anywhere he can't find the niche he does and he kind of finds this other character who doesn't really know where to go salminio's character right. and falls in love with this girl who's attracted to the fact that he's just not a normal human being right and and that's attractive to people you know because they're they're just like a little off they're a little different yeah. well i think it's intriguing and i've been i've been kind of talking about this thing because i had a conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago um and I, I think it came up with like sort of like we're talking about height or something, right? There, there's a point to this. But uh, it's like, oh, well, you know, you're below average height. I said that who wants to be average? Mm. And, you know, the, the people that don't fit in on either side of the cool kid club or the, the popular or, you know, the, the ones with means or whatever, they are always viewed as the outsiders. And then sometimes, even the movie The Outsiders are the outsiders, right? Uh, and it's the socias who are kind of the privileged, but they're very average. Who wants to be average? And, you know, that's average means you're just like everybody else. And it's okay, in fact, even better to be your own thing. Like the things you like, um, learn about the things that you like, and don't worry about what the cool kids think because in a few years, they're actually not the cool kids anymore. That's true. I also always wonder about, like, 
Sh uh, Andre's character Sean and uh, Robbie's character Patrick. It's like we know that uh, Horace is bullied. Like, why are they outside of the norm as well? I mean, I know that they have this like sort of pact together to be like and, and build this club, and they like they like certain things that other people don't like. But are they being bullied too? What pushed them away from yeah, the? You know what I mean? I definitely think uh, either one of those characters, you know, especially Sean, um, he he probably, you know, with the ones that think they're the cool kids, but are usually the ones that just need attention, right? And that's how they get it. They'll take it no matter how they get it, right? And, you know, we all experienced this through growing up. I think, you know, I experienced the same thing in seventh grade that Sean did because I was a little bit of an outsider and different because I was on TV and in movies. So you get some grief from kids that aren't on TV or in movies and don't understand how to deal with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's mostly just not knowing how to... They, it, it's not in their frame of reference yeah, yeah, yeah. to really get it. And so it sets them, sets them outside even further. But I definitely think Sean's character is either ridiculed or fun of or sneered at and that's why he you know he'll go home and just read a Stephen King novel well, and know everything about it. Very interesting home life in itself. His father's a cop. Her parents aren't doing that great together. Right. Um, so there's a little bit of like a, dist a distance from like what a normal family should be. But whose family is normal anyway? But like he has this outlet to like get away from his father and his sister and his mom because they're just bonkers people right <laughs> and he's just like i gotta get can you build me something in the back where i can like go up in there and just live in there like right. and i'm just gonna put a bunch of posters in there from stuff that you don't even understand at all right. <laughs> I think we got we're going very deep on this arrow this is this is good this is what the sarah connell show does <laughs> in the deepest yeah we're in the, <laughs> the sarah connell show brings out on people i don't know what it is that's awesome we're in, we're in the bar in the bottom of the prince Charles cinema deep cuts with the monster squad <laughs> it's good I think it's England. In, in general. In general. So I think yeah. we go a little deeper in England. <laughs> well, we, we've had better questions and great fan interaction, and yeah. they, they have a different take on it because uh, it's something that uh, they still relate to as kids. It's The story's universal and international. It doesn't matter where you're from. They can relate, but they all have their own stories. The, the great thing, I mean, the world was lucky anyway. The, the monsters happened to find... A place in the world near the monster school because they're obsessed with monsters already. You know, they studied them, they're wearing Stephen King t shirts, had the posters, they were discussing different ways to kill them, and they just turned up on their doorstep. So that was very lucky. Yeah, well, I think it's very lucky for the town yeah. and the world that they've showed up in our town because we're really the only. What well, are the chances? That's right. Well, I think what's I think what's neat is everybody asks, you know, where did this movie take place? And it's really like any town USA, but it's sort of. Bayou, Louisiana, Southwest, you know, or Southeast United States. But I, I think that's only, we only had to do it because they landed in our town. And that's where the amulet happened to be. But if the amulet happened to be somewhere else and they landed there, I, there bet be you, I bet you there's a group of kids that could have risen up and, and taken the challenge. So the, the message is there's a hero inside everyone. In, yeah. If Dracula turns up. Right, the message is if you're Dracula, don't show up. If Dracula yeah. turns up, you better hope that there's a monster squad in your town that's, <laughs> that's right. going to save the day because the cops and the army aren't going to do a damn yeah, thing yeah they're not going to do anything <laughs> but the, the those kids that are banding together and hanging out and know the stuff that not all the cool kids know they're the ones that are going to save the day See, this is the other great thing about the film because there's that many more people that know how to take down all these monsters now you know in england and just you're visiting international monster squads what you're doing basically that's right we're, we're it's, the, the word spread and the club spread and the membership has grown yeah. so uh, yeah i don't think there's anywhere to to, to come back to so i think he i think dracula's just going to stay away yeah yeah he's he's uh He's got to go to another planet or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd watch that film too. Yeah, that sounds I, awesome. I, Dracula I, on Mars. Or something? <laughs> He's like, I had nowhere else to go. I, I, I had to go to Mars. It's just him and Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> it's night time for slightly longer, and it's just Matt Damon and his potatoes. It's, he's like, I love it here because I get so much more rest. <laughs> And I have one minion. His name's Matt Damon. <laughs> 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 Any 
Sweet potatoes. That's, that's the sequel to The Martian. It's Dracula helps him get there. Like, Matt Damon didn't figure that stuff out. Or, you know, uh, whatever his name is on that. Oh, I just blanked out his name and his character name. But it's funny. It's like, he, he didn't science it, all that stuff. Dracula helped him out and get him yeah. get him off. Oh, yeah, it was Dracula. <laughs> if you, like, watch the movie, like, more closely, like, Dracula's just in the corner, like, help. He's the one that's, like, hoeing the potatoes. <laughs> Bet you didn't realize this is where this was going to go either, did you? This is all planned. I've got nine, 90 more questions about the Martian. This is this is perfect. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so of course, um, you're in the film when you you were kids your, yourself. What was it? What were your fa- sort of memories of filming it all the way back then? I, I mean, we usually talk about just kind of the the grand scale of what we were in the middle of because this was a big studio movie, is a big budget. There was a lot of awesome people working on it, and you had. Shooting a movie with nothing special in it is a big endeavor. Shooting a movie that has a bunch of kids, a ton of special effects, you've got creature effects and monsters being made. Uh, this is Those are like the three things that you don't do as a filmmaker. You, you don't do special effects, you don't work with kids or animals, and you don't have like a bunch of like application makeup and creature effects. Cause it's just, it's, it's way out of, out of the box to deal with. But you know Fred and then they had all of those things and that's what I think what we kind of remember the most is just kind of the spectacle and the the the, the scale of it but we were there and it's a lot of work you know we always talk about how much work it was and being professional and getting the job done on the day yeah I think like it was like because I we'd all watched films like E.T. Raiders of Lost Ark Star Wars whatever you know that was like our life growing up and then all of a sudden I think I'm in one of them. I think I'm in this now. Now that's, I'm in one. That's right. Because when you're on the set, like, and like, especially the last scene, the last, you know, the climactic part of the, the film, um, they yell action and like 15 giant wind machines turn on and they're just throwing like things in front of the wind machines and things are hitting us in the face and I'm just like, I think I'm in like a huge action movie, <laughs> which we were. It was. It was. And watching um, like Frankenstein like walk by, and then Dracula's like, eh. it was like, oh my god, this is crazy. Yeah, you, you you realized very quickly that this was a big this was a big deal when we were making it. Did you did you have any sense that you might still be talking about it thirty years later? Uh, n- no, not not then, and not twenty years later when this actually really started. We thought this movie would come out and uh, be a big hit, and we would move on to you know the other bigger thing, which, which which we did. But this movie didn't perform that well for you know you know probably I always think it's one of two different reasons. But now we are here, thirty years later, just going off on a big tour you know across the United States in seventeen cities, uh, film festivals and special screenings and conventions and we got a chance to do something that I've wanted to do for a very long time, is come to a screening of the Monster Squad at the Prince Charles Cinema here in London. So that's kind of a full circle and not what you would expect when you're making the movie. And this is even better. It, it is better. It's much more fun that it happened this way. I know that sounds weird. Like I know, In retrospect, you might want it to have done better then, but who knows? You can appreciate it more now, right? Yeah, I think I think most fans appreciate it more because it does feel. Like, we always talk about how like if you are in the know with Monster Squad, if you know what it is, because a lot of people don't. But if you do, and then you meet someone else that does, you're in a club. You're in a squad. Like that's something that like we always talk about when we go to conventions and things like that. And people are wearing Monster Squad shirts. It's like, and then you see another guy wearing a shirt, Monster Squad, and they're like, I know you. I got you. And like. Other people like are, you know, they'll see Stephen King rules and like Stephen King does rule. It's like no, you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't know what this is from. I genuinely thought that today when I saw the T-shirt again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does. Yeah. Stephen King does rule. It's like yeah, I know Stephen King does rule, but this is actually from this amazing movie called Monster Squad. But if someone else is wearing that shirt and then you see someone else, you're like, oh, we're like friends. Right. Like whereas like you see someone else wearing like a Freddy shirt or something, you're like. Mm. I mean, I love J- Freddy and Jason yeah. and Mike Myers and all that. It doesn't but, have the same. But it doesn't have that same. Yeah, it's like, all right, well, everybody likes Freddy Krueger, you know? But not everyone even knows what the Monster Squad is. So it makes it very special. And especially seeing fans these days, 30th anniversary, it's bonkers. It's insane. <laughs> and fun. So, of course, you knew it was a film and you were just in a production and all that kind of thing. But was it scary to film at any point? 
It, not really. Uh, I think the younger kids, like Michael and Ashley, were a little spooked on some things, obviously, because they were five, six years old at the time. Uh, you know, being Ryan and I were the two oldest cast members of the kids, but you also got to you understand how it's made. It wasn't our first set we've been on, so you also see behind the scenes a little bit, and you, you don't you you know what's going on, and it's also a lot of work. So um, I don't know if there was any time that I would have wanted to be afraid or scared or spooked or something. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't think you had time or the or the ability because you're so focused on doing so much and when you're a kid working on something regardless of what it is you're really kind of intent on doing it well or the best that you can and you hope that's good also there's like hundreds of people around surrounding you on the set it's like it's not that scary you know if i was alone like in my bedroom and then like your know, dracula walked in i'd be like okay maybe i'm a little freaked out oh i'd be freaked but, like, out now if like, that happened there's a guy like eating a sandwich in the corner like his pants are like half day you know like it's, just, like, it's not that scary so it's nicely on to uh what is your favorite second way to kill a werewolf Hmm. Of our jokey ones or the real one? I think falling out of a window onto a bomb was funny. Yeah. There, there, there's only one way. To go. There's, a, there's old age as well, apparently. Oh, yeah. yeah. Old age. Old age. What else? Was it there? Uh, accident, accident with accident power with tools? Power tools? <laughs> it's a funny line. That's a funny line. <laughs> Speaking of which, have you got a favorite quote from the film, or one that people ask you to do? Well. M- yeah, we both have our kind of go-tos that everybody loves that we get a lot. Of course, mine is uh, either kick him in the nards or we're the monster squad. Um, those are great lines. Those are the best lines that I have. Uh, but my favorite line in the movie is uh, Phoebe's when she says, I heard he killed his dad. <laughs> Talking about his character. <laughs> totally throwaway line on the side in the script, but it's off camera and it's really funny. Uh Obviously, everyone always wants me to say, I'm in the goddamn club, aren't I? Which is a great line. It's huge impact when you're watching the film, and it kind of like sets the whole climax in motion. I mean, it kind of like, this is it. It's like, we're doing this. It's like, all right, we figured out how to, what we need to do. We know what, we got the book, we found the virgin, did we? Um, We went to the, to square because monsters hate religious stuff. That's a good line. So we, <laughs> so we found the church. We're there. It's like now what? And it's like we are like kind of like scrambling. It's like, hold on. And it's funny because like in the movie, I like didn't realize this. I really nailed you. Like I pushed you out of the way. I'm like I'm in the goddamn club. And you like, well, I didn't know I did that. So I saw that recently. I was like, oh my god, damn. I'm sorry. <laughs> but my favorite line. <laughs> it's so like throw away <laughs> when uh, Andre asks when Sean asks the, your, his dad if he can go to the movie <laughs> and he says you're watching your sister's tonight and, and he goes no way <laughs> it's just I love I think I think it's a brilliant line reading I think it looks it's just really funny and it's just kind of throw it's a throwaway but right. at the same time it's one of my favorite things <laughs> One thing that kind of sets 90 Monster Squad apart, but you know, these films from the 80s is the fact that they're physical effects and there's something, it's good, yeah, practical effects. And as good as, you know, CGI gets and all that kind of stuff, it's not the same. And do you kind of wish that films would return to that a bit more or maybe develop their techniques a bit better? I do, and I think there is a little bit of kind of circling back to practical effects and uh, makeup effects and traditional Star Wars. Like, it was like, we're going to try to make this look like the original Star Wars now. Right. Like, we have to go back, because the CGI didn't work for fans. Like, we didn't, mm-hmm. we were like, this isn't Star Wars. Like, where's the, the big puppets and, the, you know what I mean? We want to see that again. And, and it shows a lot of, uh, you know, skill and craftsmanship and artistry when you're making those creatures or, you know, aliens or, you know, ghosts, whatever, whatever they are. But I think now, like, the people that are making those films uh, grew up in the era with practical effects so they're not the ones making it so they're insisting technology and digital applications are amazing and they're awesome and what i think the good ones are doing now are blending the two there's a base of practical and they're enhancing and supplementing them with the digital not the other way around and you're seeing some really cool stuff now yeah absolutely i mean you know when jurassic park came out we were like whoa like wow you can really 
sure. make this. You can do this now. Yeah. And like I, I remember Spielberg saying, he's like, I'm not doing this until you can do it, until you can actually do digital. And it's like, but it got out of hand. It got out of, it got, it's like, wait a minute, you're, you're trying to save time or money or whatever and just like by doing it in front of a computer when this could have been done. Like, you can't do giant dinosaurs and make it, it's not gonna look right, right. if you just did practical dinosaurs. It's just, they did a great job with that. But when you're creating monsters and things like that, it's like, you can build that. So just build it. And, yeah, and I, like I said, I think you're seeing a return to yeah. that a little bit and uh, it's, 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 it's going pretty good. <laughs> I think so, it's good stuff. It's been 30 years since the film came out. Have you guys been in contact the whole time? Have you got back in contact recently through doing stuff like this? Are you in contact with any of the other cast or crew members? We, said we, um, we hadn't seen each other in a long time. They finally called us to do a screening in Austin, Texas at the original Alamo Draft House. Um, uh, a guy named Eric Vespi put together this screening. And said and contacted us all individually and said, "Hey, w would you be interested in coming out and just saying hi to the fans?" And I'm like, "They're fans? <laughs> like, what are you talking about?" And like, I'm like, "We really thought we were going out there and like maybe saying hi to like ten people." I'm like, "There's going to be like five people in the audience. Like, I don't know this movie like tanked. Who watches this movie? Like, I don't know anything." And so that was the first time I'd seen him in a long time. I was like, "Hi." <laughs> yeah, uh, hadn't you know probably for that whole middle time that the movie was dead, you know, up until about 2006. Uh, but then, ever since then, we've been busy doing Monster Squad appearances. So it's been 10, 11 years of, you know, kind of regular, consistent basis. And then uh, Ryan and I actually, um, kind of almost at the same time, moved back to LA uh, to just get back where we're from and, and work on projects. And it's been great because now we get to, we don't have to wait for a Monster Squad event to hang out. And then what we've done is we've almost, we've built that into a couple things. And so um, we have a podcast that Ryan and I do together called Squadcast. <laughs> and uh, it's a little on the nose. And then, uh, but we also, it had, it had to be called that. It, it, had, to it, it had to be. There was no other, no, <laughs> no other choice. And then we also, uh, we co-host a show on um, Nerdist Network on their Alpha Premium channel called Short Ends where we curate short films and uh, theme the episodes. I mean, basically, it's kind of like a, a, an online film festival uh, where you can come and see these great short films that we've curated, and we talk about them, and we explain them, and then we also talk to the filmmakers. So that's a project that we ended up being successful in developing together and uh, working together with. And we've got a few more in the pipeline. Hopefully that'll happen. And But, you know, other cast members like Ashley, um, you know, we're still friends with and we see all the time. Um, Stephen Mock, who played my dad, all the monsters, um, you know, Tom Noonan, Duncan Regeer, uh, Tom Woodruff, uh, Michael McKay, we get to see them at conventions and appearances and other special events. So, But that wouldn't have happened if we didn't do that first event in 2006. So yeah, there's been a big sort of resurgence of, you know, nostalgia lately, returning to stuff like Ghostbusters. Do you think Monster Squad sort of ripe and ready for, you know, a, a reboot or a remake or a sequel or, or a prequel or, you know? Well, I think um, they were remaking this movie for a number of years, a few years ago, and no one wanted that. Like, all the fan, the, the true fan base was, you know, shouting from the mountaintops, do not do this. Um, I don't know what it would have turned out to be, but it ended up, you know, not happening. And uh, f fans celebrate that fact that it didn't actually happen. And so a remake is not in the works. I don't know. There may be some other type of concept with the with the idea that's going on. But, um, uh, you know, a sequel, I think, would be... If you made it just for the actual fans of the movie, uh, which is kind of a trend of things happening right now, and they're trying to make it wide. But I think if we did a sequel with the right people and the right storyline and the right... Uh, Approach. I think it would be that. That'd be pretty something cool to see, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> what do you think now? Uh, the lasting legacy of the film is. How do you think it will be remembered? What's its place in cinematic history? Interesting. Interesting. Um, I think th th everyone kind of throws the word cult film around. I think it's a little bit different than that. It's not necessarily because when I think of cult film, I think of like Rocky Horror, or The Room, or something, something that plays at midnight, and you know whatever. I don't think it's that kind of thing. I think it's I think it's way deeper than that. I think because it's something that like 
built up over the years and people found I mean Rocky Horror came out and like it kind of just kind of tumbled into being that like midnight thing like almost immediately really um, this is something that like grew and it, it grew by like passing on the VHS tape to your friend or like re renting it 5,000 times from the video store until they finally just said just just keep it <laughs> you know what I mean like I don't know if I know any other film that you that people say that stuff about you know like I just went to the video store every day and I rented it every single day and it's my favorite movie I'm not it's like you know people talk about the Goonies or E.T. or something you know what I mean like but those did really well when they came out Lost Boys you know and they like you can say like oh I went to I rented it every day it's like yes yeah, so did everyone else in the world so I mean I think the legacy of Monster Squad is that it might just well be maybe one of the only films that you can kind of say that about. I think, you know, you asked cinematic legacy. I think there's two different type of legacies since this thing is still trucking along. I think cinematic legacy, this movie really is right in the transition time of that practical effects, but with innovative, great stuff that Stan Winston and all those guys created. Plus, even the visual effects that were of the time were kind of cutting edge for, you know, late 80s. Right before that transition time, going into digital and a little more powerful technology uh, that everybody started to lean on. So I think that's sort of right at the cusp of that transition time. So cinematically, people remember it there. Also, cinematically, it was the first time you see these kind of classic Universal monsters together, um, but with a story of kids that are coming together and, and battling, you know, battling stuff. Um, the movie itself, I think the other legacy that it really has is the legacy of how it connected with the fans. And they really are connected to this movie for a number of different reasons. And, you know, they, they will say that, the, you know, I connected with this movie because I identified with the squad you know I wanted to be them I wanted them to be my friends I felt just like them as the outcast or misfits and and had to go and figure it so I found my own way because of this movie um, this movie's helped a lot of people through a lot of time you know it's really connected with them and, and we've met a lot of great fans over the years I think that's the good legacy that this move that this film has and the story and the characters um, it, hence why and that dynamic is why I wanted to produce and, and, and make a documentary to explain those great stories about the connection that Monster Squad has with these fans. And that's what we're in the middle of doing. So it's been really, really awesome. Uh, we've been on the road meeting a lot of these people and getting those interviews and, and going deeper into those questions. It's, it's been fascinating. Amazing. So you're speaking about the documentary, actually. Um, so how long has it been in production? And you know, when might we be able to see it? It's been in production um, for most of this last year. Um, is I, I think we're pretty close to um, having almost everything that we're going to get. We're here in, at the Bridge Tower shooting a little bit, so I got a, a little small crew with me here, which is awesome to capture these awesome fans because that's the whole point of this whole thing. Uh, we've got a few, um, you know, a few individual interviews left that we'd like to get, and then you know, just probably a ton of time of uh, putting together the. You know, being in post and cutting it together to, to tell the story that we want to tell is going to take some time. But we're aiming for the end of the year to be kind of finished with everything. And uh, maybe shortly after that, we'll have a finished product. So, uh, where can uh, people find you online if they want to sort of follow your journey and, you know, get in touch and all that kind of stuff? Um, my Twitter and Instagram is Ryan Lambert 111 I'm um, Twitter, I'm uh, Andre Gower Official, and at Andre Gower on Twitter. And if you want to follow some behind the scenes and progress of the documentary that we're doing, that is uh, at the squad doc on Instagram and online, the squad doc.com. So we post some photos and behind the scenes stuff and progress, and uh, fans can sign up and kind of be part of in that club as well. So follow us as we go along. And our uh, podcast is ryanandandre.com. Mm -hmm. um, and like he was talking earlier, uh, um, our show short ends. If you go to projectalpha.com, you can sign up. It's like a 30 day free trial. Amazing. We can sign up, watch only our shows. That's right. And then you can, <laughs> and then you can cancel it. Then you can cancel it or you can continue. And we just got, we are in uh, development of season two on short end. So we know we're doing that. So we got some more episodes coming your way. So finally, have you got any messages for the people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and of course the fans of the Monster Squad? Yes. If you're fans of the Monster Squad and fans of the Sarah O'Connell show, apparently you're pretty rad. 
um, you know, just go out there and find your find your club, find your crew, your squad, and um, and do some good in the world. That's you know, it's really it's only, it's going to take individuals and groups of individuals to actually make differences in whatever you give a rip about. And so, go out and do that. Ditto. <laughs> Which is a quote from Ghost. <laughs> oh no. my God! At least she didn't say Goonies. <laughs> she didn't. She, she did not say Goonies. She's never said the Goonies one. That's good because Sarah Sarah knows. She's cool. She's, she's, in, she's in the club. She's in the club. She's, she's in the club. club. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're in the club. I hope so. I've still got an original Monster Squad VHS from the 1980s. Yes. I've never parted with, even though I can't technically watch. It's in my mum's house. Oh. With all my videos. That I can't part with them. No. no. That's, that's one of my, of all the cool stuff and the posters and all that, I think the coolest thing are, is the original VHS boxes that are going around. No, no matter, the UK one's awesome in the red box and, you know, with the different emblem on it. And then the US version, they're all, they're all rad. And, um, I, I've seen the you know the VHS all the dead media from all over the world and something like 28 or 30 countries and they all have different cover art they're all pretty that's a neat thing to have so it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you both today meeting you finally having watched the film a billion times over the years uh, thank you to everyone for watching at home be sure to share subscribe give the video a big thumbs up and I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell show bye thank you bye, bye. thanks for hanging out <laughs>